Soyuz 11. They completed the longest space mission in human history, then came home, already dead. June 29, 1971. After 23 days aboard Salyut 1, the world's first space station, Soviet cosmonauts prepared for re-entry. They'd orbited Earth 362 times, photographed continents, tested life support systems, etched their names into history. At 28 minutes past 9 p.m., Soyuz 11 undocks. At 10.35 p.m., retro rockets fire. Everything runs flawlessly. The capsule withstands 3,000 degrees of re-entry heat. Parachutes deploy clean. At 1.47 a.m., touchdown in Kazakhstan. Recovery crews arrive minutes later, expecting cheers. Instead, at 2.02 a.m., technician Ivan Karlamov opens the hatch and freezes. Inside, the crew sits upright, strapped in, heads tilted, faces peaceful and blue. No panic, no violence, just three dead men. Hours later, they piece it together. A 1.2-centimeter valve opened too early, 104 miles above Earth. Cabin pressure dropped to zero in 11.5 seconds. Suited only in flight uniforms, they never had a chance. In under two minutes, they suffocated. Autopsies found brain hemorrhages, ruptured eardrums, nitrogen gas in their veins. Official time of death, 10.47 p.m., mid-descent. Soyuz 11 became the first and only case of humans dying in space. After that, pressure suits became mandatory, but it was too late for the three men who made it all the way home, only to never step outside. Soyuz 1. This space disaster will haunt you forever. Vladimir Komarov told his friends he was going to die, and then stepped into the rocket anyway. It's April 23, 1967. A Soviet launch pad, one doomed man, and a space mission that never should have happened. The countdown ends, the rocket launches, and within moments, everything begins to fall apart. Trouble brews instantly. The left solar panel jams shut, cutting power by 50%. Then, orientation sensors fail. The craft begins tumbling. For 26 hours across 18 orbits, Kamarov fights manual control, cursing, this devil ship. Nothing I lay my hands on works. On April 24th, 3.22 a.m., he fires retro rockets over the Atlantic, aiming for re-entry. Peering through a backup periscope, he aligns the 5,500-pound capsule as best he can. The main parachute, stuffed too tightly in a two-foot canister, snags. The 10-foot backup deploys, but twists into a useless knot at 190 miles per hour. The capsule hit the Earth at 144 feet per second, its titanium shell folding like paper before erupting into a fireball of shattered metal and burning fuel. Recovery crews arrive at 6.30 a.m. They find only fragments, a heel bone, pieces of skull, charred flesh. Newspapers hail him a hero. Rumors claim he flew knowing the craft was flawed, sparing backup friend Yuri Gagarin. Complex 34. Three astronauts strapped in for a test flight. What followed was 17 seconds of hell. It's January 27, 1967, Cape Kennedy, Florida. Virgil Grissom, Edward White II, and Roger Chaffee are sealed inside the Apollo 1 command module for what's supposed to be a simple pre-launch test. Just a systems check, no fuel, no liftoff. The test begins at 1 p.m. atop a Saturn IB rocket. For hours, they battle faulty comms, electrical glitches, minor annoyances in a dangerous machine. But at 6.31 p.m., something breaks. A spark, likely from frayed wiring beneath Grissom's seat, lights in the capsule's pure oxygen atmosphere, pressurized to 16.7 psi, twice that of Earth. Inside, nylon netting, Velcro, foam, everything synthetic erupts in an instant. Temperatures spike to over 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. In 17 seconds, all the oxygen is gone. Toxic carbon monoxide floods the module. The crew chokes within 25 seconds. They try to escape, but the hatch is a death sentence in disguise. A 30-inch steel plug that opens inward, requiring 90 seconds to unbolt. They don't have 90 seconds. The fire melts through instruments, cables, panels, 
feeding on every inch of the spacecraft. Pad leader Donald Babbitt and 27 technicians rush in, blinded by smoke, armed with extinguishers. They manage to crack the hatch at 6.36 p.m., five minutes too late. By the time the rescue team reached them, the flames had already finished their work. Grissom lies collapsed on the floor, white, just inches from the hatch, and Chaffee is still in his seat. All three are dead. Post-mortem, they show burns across 70% of their bodies. NASA redesigned the hatch, rebuilt the systems, but it was too late for the men who proved that sometimes, space doesn't need to kill you. The capsule can do that all by itself. The Challenger Space Shuttle. They called it Teacher in Space. A new kind of mission, but as millions were eagerly watching, disaster struck. It's January 28, 1986. Space Shuttle Challenger is ready for its mission. Among its seven crew members is Krista McAuliffe, a school teacher chosen to deliver science lessons from orbit. After five weather delays, the launch is finally greenlit. But overnight, Florida's temperature dropped to 28 degrees Fahrenheit. 18 degrees below the O-ring safety threshold. The O-rings were rubber seals designed to keep burning gases away from the rocket fuel. If they failed, those gases could ignite the external fuel tank, turning the shuttle into a 200,000-ton bomb. Engineers begged to delay the launch again. They warned that the seals might be too stiff to be safe. NASA recklessly ignores them and goes ahead with the launch. Challenger's engines roar to life, pushing 526,000 pounds of thrust. Its speed climbs to 1,900 miles per hour. At T plus 58 seconds, a puff of smoke leaks from the booster joint. At T plus 73 seconds, 46,000 feet up, the O-ring fails completely. A jet of flame burning at 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit burns through the external tank, holding 829,000 gallons of hydrogen and oxygen. 20 milliseconds later, the fuel ignites. The orbiter disintegrates in a 2 million pound fireball, shattered into 17 tons of flaming wreckage. On live TV, a NASA flight controller's voice cuts through. Flight controllers here looking very carefully at the situation. Obviously a major malfunction. The capsule with the crew inside miraculously survives the initial explosion. For 10 more seconds, it tumbles intact, but then, it completely loses stability and falls uncontrollably for three long minutes. The capsule, with all the crew aboard, ends up smashing into the Atlantic Ocean at a sickening 207 miles per hour. The impact delivers 200 Gs of force. The six astronauts and the teacher aboard instantly die. 17% of Americans, including schoolchildren, watch the tragedy unfold live on CNN. NASA's impatience and arrogance cost the lives of seven innocent people and traumatized an entire nation. Space Shuttle Columbia. They were minutes away from home, just 39 miles above Earth, but then the sky began to tear them apart. It's February 1st, 2003. Space Shuttle Columbia is preparing to return to Earth after nearly 16 days in orbit. It launched on January 16th, carrying seven crew members around the Earth for 255 times. But just 81 seconds into launch, a two-pound chunk of foam ripped off from the external tank, slamming into the left wing at 540 miles per hour. Engineers noticed, but after days of internal debate, the damage was deemed non-critical. Re-entry back into Earth's atmosphere began at 8.15 a.m., high above the Pacific Ocean, with Columbia racing towards Earth at Mach 17.6. Over California, at 8.44 a.m., temperature sensors on the left wing spike. Plasma gas at 2,700 degrees Fahrenheit pours through a 6-inch hole in the carbon tiles caused by the chunk of foam which had crashed into the wing on launch. The superheated gases melt through internal structures, causing massive damage. Sensors start to report that the space shuttle's aluminum wing is beginning to fail. 10 seconds later, at 8.59 a.m., 39 miles above Texas and traveling 12,144 miles per hour, the wing tears free. Columbia disintegrates into a 230-ton firestorm. Every crew member is killed instantly crushed by an 80 PSI pressure breach and 100 Gs of force. 
Their remains are recovered over several months, identified only by DNA. 84,000 fragments scatter over 2,000 square miles of Texas and Louisiana. A damaged helmet belonging to one of the crew is found in the middle of a field. Shuttle flights are suspended for two years. Investigators cite NASA's culture of silence, dismissal, and flawed decision-making as the cause for the disaster. Columbia stands as space's worst reckoning, a testament to NASA's hubris and the void's merciless grip.